Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news, which as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Video luck, you're having an amazing day. We have an awful lot of news to get through in this video, but I want to start things out with AMD's next generation of GPUs, which of course will be powered by the second generation of RDNA. Not least of which, these cards are of course infamous for being a big nave, or as my exclusive source told me, the NVIDIA killers, which will be comprised of nave 21, 22, as well as 23, which was the one he told me was the NVIDIA killer. Anyway, we are still without a release date officially for these GPUs, although AMD themselves have confirmed that they will be, of course, coming, and they will feature uh, things such as... Uh, hardware ray tracing. But what about the release date? Well, one of my sources, a different source, told me that these cards will indeed be the RX 6000 series and will not append their naming scheme to the RX 5000 series, which honestly is not much of a surprise. But he also told me that most likely we're looking at kind of summer-ish. He told me it could be spring, summer, for the launch, although he wasn't 100% certain of the release date as of the time he told me that information, which was prior to CES. However, uh, we might have a somewhat uh, convincing update thanks to the RRA, and this was spotted by the RRA Twitter bot, and essentially what we have here is an entry for a card which actually just uh, popped up today, funnily enough. The model is d 3 2310. I'll repeat that. D32310. And we can see as well there's several derivative names. And this was filed by ATI Technologies, which I still love the fact that the naming of uh, ATI Technologies lives on. At least, kind of lives on. Um, the only thing we can't really ascertain is what this GPU is. So this does not, for example, necessarily equate to the second generation of RDNA. And what we do know is that there have been a plethora of different products that AMD have been working on. So this could be something Nave 12 based, which could be for something Apple related from what we understand. It could be a professional related card. After all, what we do know is that um, the RDNA architecture is going to be used for different things, and one of those are prosumer type of cards, or most certainly it could also be Big Nave, which is another distinct possibility. If it is Big Nave, most likely we're looking at potentially a couple of months after these filings for the cards to launch. So, in other words, as of the time I'm recording this, which is the 19th of February, we could be looking at kind of April, May time for the GPUs to kind of pop out. It could be a little bit sooner, but most likely around two months to three months is a pretty safe bet. Is this a uh, surefire thing for it being second generation of RDNA? Well, no, honestly. It's not 100% concrete because when it comes to the naming scheme, you can kind of make a stab in the dark, but it's very difficult to know exactly. But it is quite interesting that we do know another card's pass the certification at the very least. And switching from one piece of unreleased tech from AMD, let's switch to a piece of unreleased tech from Intel's. And this one, actually there's two unreleased pieces of tech from Intel's, but we'll start things out with the CPU side of the equation. And that is the 10700F. And we actually have a benchmark, which looks to be pretty reliable. It is from the Korean website Quasar Zone. Can we just spend a moment to appreciate the name Quasar Zone? I don't know why, but that, that just tickles me in good ways. Anyway, the 10700F is an 8-core, 16-thread chip. And one can make a pretty convincing comparison to the 9900K. Indeed, the performance of this chip is essentially neck and neck with the 9900K. It scores, that is the 9900K, around 5,000 points in Cinebench R20. Obviously, that does depend upon your system configuration, 
whether you have enabled enhanced multi-core, whether you have got slow-ass memory, and so on and so on. But generally around the 4,900 to 5,000-ish points is what you can probably expect out of your 9900K. This scores around 4,800 points, with the single-core score being 492 points which essentially means that the 9700, sorry, the 10700K uh, with a modest overclock should easily be able to compete with Intel's current flagship, which is, I think, what most people anticipated, honestly. Uh, these chips, assuming they're priced fairly competitively, will probably find a decent number of fans, but also, a slight aside with this image, you'll notice under the detected GPU that we can see it's GeForce, however, the naming scheme has actually been smudged out, and I do wonder what that could mean, whether it's an unreleased GPU, or whether they're doing it just to kind of get additional attention there, or what. I would be most curious if we could peel back the layers, unfortunately a photograph doesn't quite work like that, uh, so whether that says uh, RTX 3080 or underneath, I don't know. And while I'm on the subject of Intel, I'd also like to give a quick update concerning Intel's XE architecture. Uh, this is thanks to a um, posting, funnily enough, on GDC, which is kind of a, an overview of what you can expect from a session. As I've said before, a GDC this year, one thing Intel will be doing is providing an overview to the architecture itself, like how it uh, has changed and evolved since Gen 9 and Gen 11, which of course are fairly well established right now. But, I'm going to read this out verbatim, Intel's brand new XE architecture has been teased for a while, and is scheduled for release later this year. This update brings a significant compute, geometry and throughput improvements over today's widely used Gen 9, Gen 11. This talk will provide a detailed tour of the hardware architecture behind Intel's upcoming GPUs, unveiling the structure behind its building blocks and performance implications. Special considerations will be taken to explain how graphics engineers can best exploit the XE architecture. We will then take an in-depth look at the powerful new features being introduced with this new architecture. Unfortunately, the exact performance of these GPUs, well actually any real fundamental understanding of these GPUs, to be really honest with you, is at best questionable right now because quite frankly we haven't really seen any benchmarks which I would say give an accurate portrayal of how this would do rendering any game, to be totally honest. Um, what we do know is it's built using an MCM type of design, chiplets, uh, although Intel, of course, because they're Intel, they want to be different, and they've, they've called it tiles. Each one is capable of ha housing up to 512 execution units. These are for the higher power derivatives, and from what my understanding is thus far, although things are somewhat up in the air, it can go up to two tiles for the gaming configurations, although the more powerful GPUs for data centers could be up to four tiles. So obviously you just do 512 times X number of tiles. Um, it's going to be fascinating to see exactly what Intel can do here, especially because AMD have been getting kicked so much in the shin right now with their driver situation. And quite frankly, I really hope that uh, the PR surrounding AMD's drivers uh, gets fixed. Can't really put it any other way. Um, particularly given the release of the next generation cards. It's like, I think people are just wanting to see a really viable competitor in multiple different uh, ways at this point. And while NVIDIA's drivers are definitely not perfect, they, to be honest with you, look very visually dated in terms of the GUI. And um, I, I don't think many would disagree there. Plus, of course, just the way that uh, we have Shadow Play and other things implemented, and the fact you have to sign in, there's definitely a lot of stuff to complain about with NVIDIA's drivers. But AMD have definitely had a lot of negativity surrounding their drivers right now. So, if anything, this does give Intel a really nice kind of landing pad to, to go into. Um, I'll be very fascinated to see what NVIDIA's answers are for the RTX 30 series. There are still so many rumours that we will not get Ampere, whatever you want to call the architecture, for gamers. It's specifically for data centre, and I've heard everything from we are going to get uh, Hopper, 
for gaming, all the way down to it's just going to be a Turing refresh on the Civadin M process. And honestly, I don't think anyone knows 100% right now on the side of NVIDIA. So AMD and Intel do kind of have a lot to prove, but I definitely look forward to seeing what both companies bring to the table. And now, swiftly moving on, very swiftly, to the PlayStation. This specifically pertains to a PS VR2 controller pattern, which has been discovered. And this is super interesting for a couple of reasons. You can see the patent yourself, although obviously with patents it's somewhat ambiguous on a number of the details, but it does look quite kind of interesting to say the least of what this could potentially be used for. One cannot help but draw similarities to, let's say, the Oculus Touch. Basically, when you wrap your hand, your fingers around the sensor, the controllers can then relay that information to the game, and then obviously you would look like you're grabbing a uh, object, you would be able to kind of make a fist if you wanted to punch a character, what have you. But if they detect a finger is missing, then they'll kind of extend, assume it's extended outwards. So let's say for the sake of argument, you put one finger forward, like your index finger, then it's kind of like you're pointing. But how this is going to be used in a game, of course, we can only guess in terms of the software side of things. But they also say that the, at least in the drawings, the strap itself for the controller's hand could be used and then let go of and then that could remain in the hand. So it could kind of simulate the grabbing of objects much like Valve's index controllers do. And it also looks like there's several different face buttons, four of them it looks like, and potentially there's a fifth button as well, but it could also maybe be an analog stick. Uh, I would probably guess it's an analog stick, just looking at it, or maybe some type of motion sensor, but obviously it's kind of difficult to tell from the patents, and I always point out that a patent could be different from the final implementation. And they also state that there's electrostatic sensors, or an infrared sensor as an example, and this is for finger tracking. So we have seen a plethora of different patents from Sony in the virtual reality space. And I find this interesting for another reason. And this seems to line up with what my source told me regarding the PlayStation 5. Now, once again, I'm still not stating that that source is accurate. I don't know. But um, according to him, I'll try to remember to link the video in the description. If not, uh, it, it was just up a couple of days ago. But according to him, the uh, PlayStation VR controller is called Aston. And he said that we actually saw a demo of this uh, in a trip in Japan. And basically the development kit that was Aston, the PSVR controller, was actually started originally on Neo, and this happened last year. They said that there's still demos being worked on, but finger track was flaky, but they said that the rumble inside the controller will improve. So according to him, in these early tests anyway, it's still not exactly where they expected it to be, but it's getting better. I would once again stress that I don't know whether that information is accurate, but I do find it kind of interesting that he happens to mention this, and now we discover this patent. Um, so, yeah, whether the smoke and fire equates to the same thing, I don't know. And in the final piece of news for the day, but definitely not the least important piece of news for the day, we learn that the Xbox Series X does actually feature some type of dedicated 3D audio acceleration. And this has been officially confirmed thanks to, well, GDC 2020 presentation again. Um... I'm going to read out the quote, which I find is the most pertinent. Learn from audio designers of Borderlands 3 and Gears of War 5 around how a collaboration between Microsoft, Dolby, and our middleware partners kicked off a revolution with spatial sound that turns any pair of headphones into a multi-dimensional gateway to another world. Well, that's certainly uh, hyping us up. Intendees will dive deep into the audio design pipeline, Project Acoustics, and its relationship to dedicated hardware acceleration on the newer next-generation Xbox consoles. So what we do know is, of course, that the PlayStation 5, and this has been confirmed officially via Mark Cerny and Sony numerous uh, in several different ways, that the PlayStation 5 will have some type of custom unit for 3D audio. 
But what we don't know, of course, is what the differences are between the PlayStation 5 implementation of 3D Audio and Microsoft's implementation of 3D Audio. Now, to be clear here, what we do know is the Xbox we already have, like the Xbox One, it already does support things like Dolby, but it does so without a dedicated processor like this. So I would be extremely interested to know what the capabilities of this particular chip would be. And it kind of sounds like it's not necessarily on the APU. It, I would probably guess it might be separate, much like the PlayStation. But of course, don't, um, don't be surprised if it is part of the APU. It could potentially be. But um, yeah, it looks like the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox in that way do have similar capabilities. And of course, 3D audio does make an awful lot of difference when it comes to games. So for example, the ability to know that someone's not just behind you, but that, that you can actually position them much more accurately. Because just being able to be like, oh, someone's behind me. But imagine you could just kind of actually turn around really fast in the game, of course, and then be able to have, have a pretty good positional idea of where they are based upon your understanding of where you last heard them shoot from or what have you. But how this will actually be used by developers is still up in the air. One thing that is definitely a positive, though, is at least it takes some of the processing workload off of the CPU. And I do believe that that's one thing that the consoles will definitely really push to their advantage. Quite frankly, the um, additional processors, both on the PlayStation 5 and Xbox, will really offload a lot of the work that you would see on the current generation systems. And I feel that the SSDs as well is going to be of critical importance. Anyway, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. If you did, then the normal stuff. Like, share, comment and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.